Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Gay and I'm an alcoholic. This has been a wonderful convention. There is no doubt in my mind that God is live and well here. I... Uh, Doing the sobriety countdown and the sobriety count up kind of reminds me of a, a, a meeting I went to a few weeks ago in uh, San Antonio. This, this guy was at the meeting. I wasn't, I didn't know him real well. I uh, didn't know him at all, actually. And he came in and he said, uh, I have double digit sobriety. He said, I am so excited. I ha- finally, finally, I made double digit sobriety. I've been sober 10 days. <laughs> It just warmed my heart, you know, but each day of sobriety is a is a miracle, you know, and I had that miracle in my life yesterday. I stayed sober all day yesterday. I didn't have to take a drink, and, and that's a miracle. I um, heard a story about this, this guy that was sitting at a bar drinking, and when he got it, he, well, he drank quite a bit, you know, and then he drank a little bit more, but, but uh, it was time for him to leave, and when he got up, he fell down. And he tried to get up again, and he fell down. So he crawled over to the door, and he tried to get out of the door, and he fell down again. So he just crawled out of the bar to his car, and he tried to stand up and get in his car, and he fell down again. So he lived just a couple of blocks from the bar, so he decided that he'd go ahead and crawl on home. So he crawled all the way home, and when he got home, he tried to stand up, and he fell down again. So he reached his key up, got it in the door, you know, pushed the door open and, you know, crawled on into the bedroom and he tried to get up and crawl in bed and he fell down again. And so he ended up just spending the night on the floor. His wife was working night shifts, so, you know, when she got home the next morning, she looked at him and she said, you've been drinking. And he looked up at her and he said, I have not And she said, yes, you have. The bartender called, and you left your wheelchair there again. (laughs) I like telling that story because it just is a reminder to me that alcohol touches everyone's life that, that, that picks up the drink. I, um... (laughs) <laughs> I um, tell you a little bit about the family that, that I grew up I grew up in. I uh, grew up in a town called Fredericksburg, Texas, and my parents moved there when I was probably about a year old. And my, my parents um, had had three dates when they decided to get married. And we just got through celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary last August. And um, they had a, a child, you know, after they'd been married a year or so, and his name was Joe. And uh, they were living in a small town, and they went out to eat to a, a restaurant, I think, after one of Dad's ball games or something. And it was a small little little community, and the little boy got up, you know, Joe got up and was dancing to the jukebox with other kids. And my parents, you know, looked down to see what they wanted to order and looked back up, and he was gone. So they, uh, you know, jumped up immediately and, and uh, you know, went to find him. And when they did, they found him outside with his head between the wheel of a car and a curb. And they put him in his arms, and they drove the 30 miles to the nearest hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival. And the reason I share that is so that you can kind of understand the kind of home I was brought up in. There was lots and lots of laughter, but there was always this undertow of silence. And after they had uh, Joe, my mom found out that she was pregnant with my sister, and her name is Joy. And then they had me, and my name is Gay. And then they had my brother, and uh, his name is Happy, Joy, Gay, and Happy. That's not a true story, but I like to tell it. (laughs) My 
sister's name is Joy. My name is Gay, and we call my brother Bubba. <laughs> and that is a true story. <laughs> and um, I, from the get-go, you know, felt like I was different, felt like I was unwanted, felt, you know, all those things that, that we hear so much about, you know, I, uh, that feeling, you know, like I really don't fit in. And in addition to uh, them having another girl, and I thought they wanted a boy, and they just had me, and, you know, and then they tried again and finally got that boy they wanted, you know. But I was also born legally blind. My visual acuity is 20 over 200. That kind of sort of means if I stood 20 feet from an object and you stood 200 feet from an object, we'd see it about the same. In addition to that, I'm real sensitive to light, so the brighter it is, the more trouble I have seeing, and I'm also colorblind. And I just, you know, just didn't feel like I fit in. I can see well enough to walk around, you know, I can make my way around, you know, but there were so many things I just couldn't do, you know, that other kids were doing, and I just, I felt different, especially at about the time that I started school. I had one teacher that... Um, in the third grade that seemed to understand, you know, about visual impairments or being legally blind, and she got me some big print books. And the books were kind of like the size of an encyclopedia, and uh, I opened that book, and it was pretty good-sized print, and I could actually, you know, if I held it close enough, I could actually read it, and I kind of felt excited, you know, that, that you know, it felt good. And then that other kid started making fun of me. And I closed that book, and I only opened it if I had to, because I didn't like you teasing me and making fun of me. And um, I um, pretty much felt sorry for myself. I pretty much, you know, uh, isolated, you know. Uh, at recess, there is a kind of a strip of shade by the, the building you know, where the classes were, and I'd kind of gravitate to that shady spot because it made it a little bit in, easier for me. And there were so many games that the other kids played that I just, I couldn't do. And um, my dad, you know, had a lot of anger, and he would tell me things, and my brother and sister, I wasn't singled out here, but he'd tell me things like I was dumb and lazy and stupid, and I believed him. You know, I know, I know it was true. And, um, you know, between my visual impairment and, and my father's comments, I didn't, didn't have a very high impression of myself. And I, it was probably about my, uh, between my eighth and ninth grade, somewhere through there, I went to a party one summer as a, a few weeks before school started and the kids were drinking alcohol. And I drank, I think, seven glasses of vodka that night. And uh, I don't, I don't quite remember getting home. When I woke up the next morning, there was stuff matted in my hair, and um, my head hurt. You know, I felt a little uh, nauseated. And the first thought that went through my mind was, I want to do that again. <laughs> And I did. I, I drank every chance I had the opportunity to because the alcohol did something for me. When I put alcohol in my body, it did something for me. For the first time, I felt comfortable. I felt like I fit in. I felt smart. I felt, I, I felt a part of, and I liked the way alcohol made me feel. I, uh, most of my drinking was done on weekends because that's usually when we could get it. And I grew up in this small town of Fredericksburg, Texas. And we would go up and down this main street, and then we'd circle through this little uh, hamburger stand that we called the tower. And then we'd go back and forth up and drag Main and then go through the tower and drag Main till we found somebody that was old enough to buy alcohol for us. And then once we got the alcohol, the beer, we would start making bigger circles out of the town to, you know, till we finished drinking and then we'd, you know, come on back into town. And that was kind of how my weekends were spent. There wasn't much else to do in a little town, so I thought. And, uh, when I graduated, I graduated 150 out of 152, and uh, which didn't surprise me much because, like I said, I knew I was dumb. And then I started thinking, you know, if I graduated 150 out of 152, 
That means that there's two people that are dumber than me. I felt kind of good about that. I, um, after I graduated, I wasn't, uh, I really wasn't sure what to do with my, my life, so I got married. And, um, I had a, I had, I had a, you know, a year later I had, I, uh, we had our first child and his name was Toby. And, um, I loved being pregnant and I loved being a mom and I loved, you know, playing with the kids all day long. I thought that's what a mom's supposed to do. I didn't get that part about cleaning house and, and stuff. I, we just had a good time, but my kids had to go to bed early so that I could drink, you know. I um, actually, the first few years we were married, I didn't drink a whole lot, you know, because we just really didn't have have a lot of money. And then my sister moved. Uh, I was living at, at uh, Friendswood, which is a town right outside of Houston. And my sister moved to Houston because she was going through a divorce. So we started going. I started going out with her because, you know, that's what a good sister would do. You wouldn't want her to just go out by herself and not know anyone. So we started going to this country western place called Mickey Gillies. And um, and they had on Sunday night, they had these things called beer bust. And you could uh, pay $5 and you could drink all you wanted. You know, this was one of those places, you know, where they have the mechanical bull go in and, the, you know, dancing. We we went there so often that when we walked in, they'd say, hi, Joy, hi, Gay. And uh, I never knew how much I drank. They just kept filling it up, and I kept, you know, pouring it down. And then my sister had the nerve to go start dating people and getting a life. <laughs> and I didn't have anyone to go out with anymore. You know, I couldn't drive, you know, because... Uh, they think you ought to be able to see traffic lights and things like that. <laughs> so, um, and that was that was a time in my life that was really hard when I saw all my friends, my brother and my sister, getting their driver's license, and I couldn't. You know, that was that was really a tough time for a teenager. Anyway, I the rest of my drinking career was done at home alone. You know, or at least most of it was done at home alone. And I'd put the kids to bed early, and I'd uh, get drunk. I'd pass out, and I'd get up the next day, play with the kids, put them to bed early, and, and you know, so that I could drink. My husband and I kind of had this little deal going, you know, that before he left for work, he'd make sure that there was enough beer in the icebox so that if uh, he came home late from work, that I'd have my beer, you know. And a couple of times he forgot and I'd have to walk. I'd take those two kids, and we'd walk a mile and a half to the nearest convenience store because I needed my beer. You know, I'd reached that point in my alcoholism where I had to drink. And one one day my daughter went into the hospital, and she was there for five days. And during those five days, I didn't drink, and I thought I had licked the alcohol problem. And on the way home from the hospital, we stopped at a Mexican restaurant, and I was drunk before I got home. And one of those nights, I think it was that night actually, I got on my knees and I said a prayer that went exactly like this. I said, God, either change me or let me die. I don't want to live like this anymore. And the next day I picked up the phone and I called Alcoholics Anonymous. And they told me where the nearest meeting was. There's a meeting a mile and a half away right next to that convenience store where I walked to get my uh, my beer. I don't know about y'all, but I think a mile and a half is a little too far to have to go to an AA meeting. <laughs> but but I did. I, I walked a mile and a half over to that meeting, and I uh, 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 two people stuck out. Actually, three people stuck out in my mind. One of them at the end of the meeting when we were holding our hands and saying the Lord's Prayer, he said, Honey, don't put your faith in any one person. Put your faith in God. You know, we're all human and we can let you down, but the program of Alcoholics Anonymous will never let you down. 
And there was another lady there, and she uh, stole the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and gave it to me. (laughs) I am grateful we still have thieves in Alcoholics Anonymous. And there was another guy there by the name of Frank, and he, uh, he took me home from that meeting. He drove me home, and he got, drove up to my house, and he said, uh, you need to learn how to swallow your pride instead of alcohol. And it took me years to figure out what he was talking about. So I walked into the house, and I opened up the big book of Alcoholics, and then, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, I walked over to the refrigerator, and I got a beer, and I opened a beer, and I started drinking beer and reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't get any better. And, uh, but I figured it out, you know. I figured out that what I had done wrong is I didn't have one of those 12-step calls. You were supposed to have a 12-step call. I heard somebody talking about that at that meeting. So I... Uh, After drinking and reading that book for about uh, six months, I I called Alcoholics Anonymous for the second time, and I told them that I needed someone to do a 12-step call. I needed someone to come to my house and talk to me. So they sent two ladies over to my house, and I took those two ladies uh, back to my bedroom because I didn't want my kids to know that, that, that I was drinking. I, after I had Toby, I had, I had a little girl a couple of years later, and her name is Heidi. And, and uh, like I said, I just loved being a mom. And the day that I gave birth to both of those kids, I felt like I had touched a piece of heaven. But uh, anyway, I had these two ladies, you know, in my bedroom with the door closed, so my uh, kids that were older by this time didn't know that I was drinking. And... Uh, I'll never forget that day. These, they were so gentle, so loving, so kind. And one of the ladies picked up my hand, and she patted it. And I started crying. I'd never felt such warmth coming from, from any two people in my life. And uh, I started crying, and I started telling them why I drank. I told them that I drank because I was legal, legally blind. And the lady picked up my hand, and she patted it, and she said, Bullshit. (laughs) I I told them I I drank because I was German. I told them I drank because I was in a bad marriage. And their answer was the same each and every time. So after sitting there a little bit, you know, I started wondering, well, if this isn't the reasons why I drink, then why do I drink? And those two ladies started explaining to me the disease of alcoholism. And they invited me to a meeting that night. And I went to my second meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was on October the 23rd, 1985. And I haven't had a drink since. I believe that uh, that night that I got on my knees and I said, God, help me or let me die, that I did my first step. I was finally admitting that I was powerless over alcohol and there wasn't, there wasn't anything that I could do. I needed help. And I think sitting around the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and listening to y'all talk and hearing about the miracles in your life, I started realizing that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. That second step, you know, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. It took me, a, took me quite a while, a couple of years, before I figured out that really in the second step I was admitting that I was insane, you know, that I needed help in that area. And um, I got a sponsor, and I started going through those steps. And I did, you know, when I did that third step prayer with my sponsor, uh, on our knees, you know, and turned my will and my life over to the care of God. About that same time, I heard this story, and it just really touched my heart and, and made uh, that third step come alive for me. And it was about a young man and an old man that were standing by this corral. And the young man looked at the old man and said, this is a good day. And the old man said, we'll see. 
And the horses got out of the corral and ran away. And the young man looked at the old man and said, this is a bad day. The old man said, we'll see. A few days later, the horses came back and they brought with them this beautiful stallion. And a uh, wild stallion. And the young man looked at the old man and said, this is a good day. And the old man said, we'll see. And uh, the young man got on the horse, you know, to try to break it. And he fell off and broke his leg. And he said, this is a bad day. And the old man said, we'll see. And a few days later, war broke out, and they came to get the young man, but he couldn't go. His leg was broken. And he said, this is a good day, and the old man said, we'll see. And hearing that story, about the same time I did my third step prayer, made me understand, you know, in fact, my sponsor told me, you know, Gay, your future is none of your business. And I believed her. And I started turning my will and my life over to the care of God. And I started trusting and stopped judging my life and stopped labeling it as good or bad. You know, of myself, I don't know a good day from a bad day. Of myself, I don't know a tragedy from a miracle. You know, I thought it would be awful to be an alcoholic. And now, you know, I count that one of my blessings. Because without being an alcoholic, I never would have met you. And without meeting you, I would have never learned about life, you know. And um, I am grateful, and I'm glad I don't know a good day from a bad day or a tragedy from a miracle because cause what would happen, you know, in the next few years of my sobriety, I needed to believe that. And um, it was shortly after after this, and I went ahead, and, I mean, I went through my through the rest of my steps also, and it was about two years sobriety or something like that, I went through a divorce. I'd been married 16 years, you know, we had those two kids, and it was uh, the most painful thing I think I've ever experienced. And uh, I, I had no job skills. I didn't know how I was going to support myself. I couldn't drive, you know, and it was a pretty, you know, scary time of my life. And um, I was glad that I had finally, you know, made the connection with Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, when I first got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I felt like I was so unique, you know, like a lot of us do, and that I didn't feel in and fit in. And some uh, lady told me, you know, you know, you've got to get over that uniqueness or you're going to die. You know, you can't be, you know, terminally, terminally unique. You know, let's find the things that are similar in us. And I started doing that. And I felt, uh, part of the reason I felt like I didn't fit in is that my drunk log was so boring, you know. I didn't have anything exciting to tell. And I'd listen to some of y'all talk, and and some of y'all had been to jail. (laughs) And I was so jealous. (laughs) And one night at a meeting, a guy by the name of Steve, you know, who had done everything, is a very colorful fella, and he said, you know, I feel exactly the same way Gay feels. And for the first time, I felt like I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, that there was a chair for me, too. Anyway, I I was going uh, through this divorce, and I ended up um, in a psychiatric hospital with about with two, three years of sobriety. I lose track of time. And they diagnosed me with depression. And uh, But I had done these steps. I did my third step, and I knew that everything underneath it, I knew everything was going to be okay. I knew I didn't understand what was going on in my life, but I, I, I knew everything would be okay. And I was there for 17 days, and they didn't know what to do with me, so they put me on the alcohol ward, you know. And it was like an AA retreat, kind of like this convention. I had a great time, y'all. <laughs> If any of you need a break, you know, just go check in, you know. <laughs> and when I left that psychiatric hospital, you know, uh, 17 days later, I it was actually in that hospital that I made the decision to leave the marriage. And uh, it gave me that space, you know, to, and that time, you know, to be able to, to think and to, to make that decision because my depression was, was coming from a, I couldn't accept the marriage and I couldn't change it. And I couldn't accept it, and I couldn't change it, and that's an awful spot to be. But I guess while I was in that hospital, I was finally able to make the decision to leave that marriage. And a lady picked me up from the the Commission for the Blind and took me to public housing for blind people. And that was quite an experience. 
but like I said, I don't know a good day from a bad day or a tragedy from a miracle, and and that turned out to be a real blessing too because I started learning about my own visual impairment. Most of the people that were there were totally blind, and uh, I had been there about two or three hours, and I had never experienced such a lonely feeling. And uh, I heard some laughter outside. It was a little apartment complex that had probably about 16 little apartments. And I went to see where the laughter was coming from. And uh, there was a whole group of totally blind people. Some of them were partially sighted like me. And um, they were all drinking. And I thought, you know, I've got to find a meeting. So I went and I called and I found out where the nearest meeting was from that uh, housing. And I called and I, the guy that answered the phone, uh, I told him, I said, I need a ride to a meeting. Is there anyone that could pick me up? And the guy on the phone said, hey, Jack, can you pick up this lady? Hey, Mary, can you pick up this lady? Hey, George, can you pick up this lady? There wasn't one person there that night that was willing to give me a ride to Alcoholics Anonymous. But they were willing to tell me how to get there by bus. And uh, so I tried. I walked a couple of, I wasn't real familiar with the area. I'd only lived there a few hours. And I walked a couple of blocks to the bus station and I got, I mean the bus stop, I got on the bus going the wrong direction and it took me several hours to get back. And the next day I called my home group and somebody from that group came over and, uh, helped me locate a meeting and uh, we went, she drove me over there. I met some of the people and I never had trouble getting a ride, you know, after that point. But y'all tell me that there'd be a time that y'all wouldn't be around, that I had to develop a relationship with God because God was the one that was going to keep me sober and there'd be that day. And I was glad y'all had taught me how to connect to a power greater than myself. I, um, from that that uh, public housing for blind people, I ended up moving to uh, San Antonio, and I was um, they had a program through the Commission for the Blind that helped blind people become self-employed, and I went through that program and uh, got a facility to run in San Antonio. It was uh, at an industrial plant. It was called E.G. and G. Automotive Research. It's now called per- Perkin Elmer. And they had, at this little plant, they had about 300 employees. And um, I ran the little coffee shop for them. And I had two employees working for me. And I had never done this kind of work before. And I, I didn't... Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, to be honest, but but um, I wasn't alone, you know. Y'all taught me that. I'm never alone. And the second day of work, one of the employees didn't show up. And the third day of work, this lady walks in, and she said, I'm here to take your order. And I didn't have a clue what I needed. You know, we went through three months of training, but it just didn't seem like enough. And I didn't know how much food these people were going to eat. But this lady did because she had taken the orders from the previous manager. And... Uh, She helped me fill out an order, and uh, she started opening the refrigerators, the freezers, the cabinets, and placed an order based on what the previous manager had ordered. And I don't know how we got on the subject, but that lady was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is how my God takes care of me. And she started picking me up and taking me to meetings, and she became my sponsor. And at a meeting one night, I met a guy that... um, Um, it was raining and he said Gay let me pick you up tomorrow morning and drive you to work and it was so hard to swallow that pride and say yes thank you and he did for the next year he picked me up and drove me to work each morning the first uh, few weeks you know I I walked to work maybe it was a month or so and and I walked uh, early in the morning it was still dark carrying two hundred dollars of opening cash down a dark road in a town that I wasn't that familiar with and I was scared but there again y'all taught me to to trust this power greater than myself that God that you know I was never alone and um, I paid that guy a dollar a day because I wanted to be self-supporting, declining outside contributions, you know. And there was times when I would close that little coffee shop 
And at the end of the day, I'd get down on my knees, and I thank God for the opportunity to work. I had never supported myself in my life, you know, and I was supporting myself for the first time, and I was so grateful, so grateful to have a job. And like I said, I my timing isn't real good at explaining all this, but my son was graduating from high school and going into college. And we went out to uh, UTSA, University of Texas at San Antonio, and to fill out an application for him. And I thought, you know, I think I'll fill one out too. <laughs> I know, it sounded silly. But you tell me God either is or he isn't. You know, if I was supposed to get in, I would. And if I wasn't, I wouldn't. And I, uh, for some reason, they accepted me. <laughs> And I took a class with my son. That was so much fun. I, I scored higher than he did. <laughs> I studied. He didn't. <laughs> and uh, going to school was such an adventure for me. I, I, had, uh, I liked it. You know, I, um, they had a disabled student services, and they had people that would take notes, you know, on carbon paper where they'd write them and then tear it off at the end of the class, and I'd get my copy and they'd get their copy. I had a handheld telescope where if I used this telescope, I could read things off of the board, you know. And I had, um, I took a statistics class, and in the statistics class I had a talking calculator. But that that class was really tough because I was juggling all these visual aids, just trying to you know keep up with the class. And I took a science class, and and uh, we were studying the brain. And the uh, the professor wanted us to go buy an ounce of brain and bring it to the, you know the class. So I went over to the, the the store you know on campus, and I said I need to buy an ounce of brain. <laughs> And he said, uh, what kind of brain do you want? And I said, well, what kind of brain do you have? He said, well, we've got a doctor's brain uh, for $500. We've got a lawyer's brain for $1,000. And we've got an alcoholic's brain for $5,000. And I said, why in the world would the brain of an alcoholic cost so much? And the guy said, well, it's never been used. <laughs> I, I told that story to the convention that I, uh, about a couple of years ago, to a convention that I was speaking at. And after the convention, this guy walks up to me and he said, was that a true story? <laughs> I said, keep coming back. <laughs> anyway, I uh, in 2001, May of 2001, I graduated magna cum laude. And that's a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't think it matters whether you have a degree or you don't have a degree, but I think it's real important that we're doing whatever it is that God wants us to do because I believe that God has a plan for each and every one of us. There's so many things that I have learned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, one of the things that I have learned is that God loves each and every one of us exactly the same. And that was, that was, you know, so important for me to know that he loves us all exactly the same. And I learned that I'm not uh, better than or less than or equal to anybody else. My whole life I was either less than or better than or equal to. And, you know, being equal to takes a lot of energy because you're always doing this comparison thing, you know, to, to find out. And working through these steps, you know, and getting those things that blocked me from the sunlight of the spirit, you know, I learned that I, uh, that everybody is just on their own path. You know, I heard this story about these two hobos or whatever that were drifters or whatever that were going from town to town, you know, they kind of met up with each other. And one was grumpy, you know, just a grumpy man, and the other one was just happy-go-lucky. And, um, 
the grumpy one, you know, is talking, talking, and he said, if only I had money, then I'd be happy. And the, 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 the happy-go-lucky one said, I, he said, I really, I have a lot of money. He said, I'm a multimillionaire. He said, I already lived that lifestyle. He said, I wanted to see what it would be like to live this lifestyle. So for the last five years, I've just been going from town to town, and the people I've met are so wonderful and kind and loving. And, you know, I don't think it matters, you know, what we do in life as long as we're doing what God wants us to do. I think God's got a plan for each and every one of us. You don't know what it's like to walk in my shoes, and I don't know what it's like to walk in yours, but but we can both be here honoring each other's lives, you know. And um, another thing I've learned in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is that, that this program is a gift. You know, I get to do these steps. I get to go to meetings. I get to do my four-step. I get to have a sponsor. This program is a gift. You know, when I sit at meetings and I hear these people, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you know, and I thought, oh, man, if they only knew that they're being offered, you know, if they only knew what they're being offered, what a gift, you know, this this life of recovery. I... um. I also learned that uh, because of what I've been through, exactly the way I've been through it, that I can touch somebody's life that nobody else can touch. And because of what you've been through, exactly the way you've been through it, you can touch somebody's life that nobody else can touch. That God's got a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. I, um, When I was in that public housing for blind people, I... Um, I had better vision than, than the rest of them there because I'm just right at the top end of the scale where they draw the line for legal blindness and that feeling of uselessness and self-pity started slipping away for me because I could see how I could help other people with the vision that I had. And there was two ladies that really touched my heart. One of them was a lady named Elsie. She was an older lady, and she'd call me up and say, Hey, Gay, can you take me to the star to get to get some ice cream and I said sure Elsie I'd be happy to so Elsie would hold on to my arm and we would walk to the grocery store and she'd buy her ice cream and we'd uh and I'd take her back you know to to her room and I had another lady that would do the same thing her name was Nancy and Nancy would call me up Nancy was totally blind and Nancy would call me up and say hey gay will you take me on a beer run <laughs> And I said, sure, Nancy, because y'all taught me nobody's going to stop drinking till they're, till they're ready to stop drinking. So Nancy would hold on to my arm, and we would walk the three blocks to the store to get her beer. And uh, one day I asked her, I said, Nancy, why are you totally blind? What happened? And she said, well, her mother had, uh, uh, she had picked up some forks and got mad and poked them in her eyes. And the next day she had a different story, and the next day she had a different story. <laughs> you know how us alcoholics are. <laughs> but when I was walking with Nancy and she was holding on to my arm, she couldn't get away from me, and I got the chance to tell her about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and... I, I believe so strongly, you know, in all of these steps. But this, you know, you, you hear that the 10th, 11th, and 12th step are maintenance steps, you know, and I believe that's true. I'm not here to argue with anyone. But for me, the 10th, 11th, and 12th step has been my growth steps. You know, when I'm willing to take the time to do them, I just continue to grow. And I believe I have only touched the surface of what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer. Just scratched it, you know. I believe that, that there's so much more for me to learn about my higher power who I choose to call God. I believe in doing, or what I do is I do, when anything is bothering me, I get up, get out a paper and a pen, and I do a tenth step, a written tenth step. You know, we continue to take personal inventories. And the fourth step shows me how to take that inventory. 
So I pick up a paper and a pen and I write out. I am, you know, I write it out just like I did a four step, and then I go on and do the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth step, and you know, I do the, the spot check inventories and and you know, going through my day. But I also do those written inventories when there's anything that's bothering me. And to give you an example of one that I I've done in the last, you know, actually it was last year. You know, we went on a trip to. Uh, to New York. We went to Atlantic City first and then to New York and my mother and my father, my brother and my sister, and my nephew, my husband and I, you know, went on this trip. And we had reservations in advance and when we got to Atlantic City, there was uh the hotel we were at, you know, only had two rooms left. So my mother and father and my husband and I took the one room, you know, and my brother and his wife and, and son took took the other room. When I got to the room, it was a nice room, you know, it was a suite. It had the, the bedroom, the little hallway, and the little living area, two TVs, you know, I think three phones. I think there was, you know, a phone in the bathroom, too. I don't remember. But, you know, it was a nice room until I found out that my brother got the penthouse suite. <laughs> His bathroom was bigger than our whole room, yeah. And those feelings came up inside of me that I wasn't getting my share. And the first thing I wanted to do was you know, write about it, do an inventory on it, because when I do that, you know, it goes away. It just does, you know. And I can, uh, I didn't have to be sarcastic, you know. I could just just write it and let go of it. And in that third column of the t- of the four step or tenth step, you know, what's being affected? I realized that it was tapping into that fear of that, you know, I wasn't getting my share. You know, I wasn't getting what was mine, you know, and, and, you know, it was tapping into to those feelings and I was able to, you know, let go of them, ask God to remove them, that fear, you know, because God is my source and there's always enough for me. There is always enough for me. Sometimes I forget that and then, then I do this so that I get put back on track. Anyway, two days, days later, we were in New York. And we were checking into our whole hotel, or starting to check into our hotel, and that was last August when they had the blackout in New York. And um, we spent that night uh, on cots in a big uh, conference room, laying side by side, and I just sat there and giggled, you know, that uh, 48 hours before, I was concerned where the bed was. <laughs> 48 hours later, I was glad there was a bed, you know, and it didn't matter if it it was in a room with, you know, 30, 40 other people. You know, I was glad I was one of the lucky ones because a lot of them were just sitting on the floor downstairs. And um, the 11th step, you know, praying is, is, you know, talking to God, you know, and, and meditation is listening to God and and I do meditation. I, I sit still and listen to God. And some days when I'm doing that, I get this wonderful uh, peace come over me. And some days when I do that, my mind's wandering so fast that, that you know, I just can't seem to hold it still. But I don't think it matters. I think what matters is that I was willing to sit there and make myself available to my God. And... Uh, the 12th step, you know, and the 12th step, each morning I get on my knees and I say, God, how may I serve you today? And the adventures that that's taken me on are amazing. I um, I got a, one day after saying that prayer, I got a call from a guy in San Antonio that was running another facility, and he's totally blind, and he said, can you take me to my son? He's in an emergency room, and, and I talked to Roy, my husband, you know, I've remarried, And uh, we jumped in the car, picked him up, and we headed for the emergency room, which was two and a half hours away. On the way to the emergency room, I said, why is your son in the emergency room? And the guy said he overdosed. And I broke my anonymity, and I told him that I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I got to that emergency room, I I found myself sitting on a bed with a 20-year-old guy holding hands, and telling him about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, 
I just had so many experiences like that. One one day, you know, my husband and I decided we'd just take off for a couple of days, and we drove to Louisiana. And we went to, you know, anywhere I go, I try to find a meeting to go to. And we attended a meeting, and uh, I shared a little bit. And at the end of the meeting, the a lady walked up to me, and she said, Gay, I'm supposed to be sharing my story in an hour from now at a treatment center. She said, they can hear me any time. Would you go share your story? So I get in the car with people I don't know, driving someplace I don't know, and we ended up at this little treatment center, and there's probably about six or seven people there. And I shared the story that I'm sharing with you all. And when I finished, this one lady walked up to me, and she said, Lady, I don't know how you got here today, but I needed to hear exactly what you had to say. And uh, God just leads me and moves me. I... uh Sometimes I feel like I get to sit on the first row seat and watch miracles happen in this program. And um, one night I was sitting at a meeting in Fredericksburg, Texas, and there was a girl there, and she was uh, concerned that she was going to have to go to this prison facility, kind of treatment facility, and I didn't have any experience with that. But the guy sitting next to me, she was on one side, this guy was on the other side of me, and he said he had been to a place like that, and um, and that it was truly amazing how it had changed his life, that he was glad that he ended up there because that's where he, he learned about recovery. I, I didn't have anything to share with her, but I got to watch one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic, and I saw that miracle happen. And I see those miracles all the time when I'm willing to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. I'm willing to do these steps to get rid of those things that block me from the sunlight of the Spirit, the things that block me from God. When I'm willing to do the the tenth step, you know, get rid of those things, and the eleventh step, you know, making contact with God so that in the twelfth step I know it is what He know what it is that God wants me to do. I don't. I think that that needs to be done with prayer. I think some of of us are meant to serve in one way and others of us are meant to serve in another way. I think some of us make great sponsors and I think some of us don't, you know. I think some of us make good representatives and some of us don't. But I think, and some of us do at different times in our sobriety. So I think service work always needs to start with prayer. Two days before I graduated from, from, from college, I got a letter in the mail. And the letter said, Gay, the fourth edition of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous has been accepted, and your story has been selected to be in that book. And I felt very honored. I I shared that with my sponsor. I called her and told her, you know, a, a few weeks later, you know, I was in a state of shock for a while. But I told her, called her a few weeks later and told her, and she said, Gay, it's just a 12-step call. She said, it's a big 12-step call, but it's just another 12-step call. And I, um, my life is so different today. You know, I married a man that's absolutely wonderful to me. Roy, would you raise your hand? Uh, he tells me thing, things like, uh, real frequently when we wake up in the morning, he'll say, good morning, beautiful lady. And uh, I've never, I've never had a man in my life that treated me so good. I, uh, one of the most, Im- I, the, the family, the, my relationship with my son, he's 30 now, and and my daughter's uh, 26, 27, and I've got good relationships with both of them. My son one day was telling me about all his friends that drank, and I said, Toby, just send them to me. And he said, Mom, if I sent my friends to you, I wouldn't have any left. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my daughter was driving with me telling about one of her friends that was having some problems, you know, and the, the, the friend was going to go to counseling. And my daughter told the friend, just go talk to my mom. You know, that's a gift of this program. And I have a little granddaughter, and she's four years old. And I was on the phone with her the other day, and she calls me Gigi. And she said, Gigi, what are those letters before .org? You know, she wanted PBSKids.org, but she couldn't remember all those letters. You know, a four-year-old asking for an Internet address. I was... (laughs) 
I was really touched. And uh, a few weeks ago, my daughter-in-law asked me if I wanted to come with her and my son and that little granddaughter to find out whether their next child was going to be a girl or a boy. My daughter-in-law, you know, invited me to come along. You know, the, the the gifts of these programs just seem to never end, you know. I learn about love and tolerance in these programs, you know. I, I give away what I get because I want to get more, and that's what you told me. If I keep getting away what I get, that I'll get more and more. I have uh, one of the prayers that I say is, God, don't let me block the abundance that you have in store for me. And to me, that is just like saying, thy will be done. Because I believe my God wants me to be happy, joyous, and free. And when I say, God, let me accept the abundance that you have in store for me, is another way for me to say, thy will be done. And I, that was one of the hardest things I had to learn how to do was to let life be good. You know, I knew how to be miserable, but I didn't have a clue how to let God life be good, and y'all taught me. He taught me how to do that, and I am so grateful for my sobriety, and I'm grateful that you invited me to come here and share it with you. There's a song that, that, that I, you know, we sang when I was in high school, you know, it went, in heaven there is no beer. That's why we drink it here, and when we're gone from here, my friends will be drinking all my beer. Well, I kind of changed the words to that, you know. In, in heaven there is no beer. That's why we drink it here. And since I stopped drinking so much beer, I have found heaven right here. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.